This is Michael McQuistian, composer for Young Justice, and you're listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files. Recognized, Uncle Walker, D, 0, 1. Recognized, Greg XB, D, 5, 2. Hello, team. Today in the Watchtower, we are joined by Greg Bashansky. Greg is the host of Spectacular Radio, a podcast celebrating the Spectacular Spider-Man animated series, reviewing it as fans, and bringing in Greg Weissman and other cast and crew members to provide extensive behind-the-scenes stories to document the making of that great series. Greg is also a graduate of the Los Angeles Film School with a major in production and screenwriting, as well as being a former staff member of the Gathering of the Gargoyles annual convention. Greg, thanks so much for joining us in the Watchtower. Thank you for having me. And I want to say something. You are one of the gold standards for podcasts. Listening to your show, which I started earlier this year, it expanded my horizons and what a podcast dedicated to a TV show like this can be. Oh, uh, okay. You caught me off guard. Thank you, Greg. I really appreciate that. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that our discussion episodes draw on anything and everything related to Young Justice up to and including episode 16 now of season three the comics and the video game if you've not seen read or played all of the material and are spoiler wary please consider this your warning and with all that out of the way let's dive in um Greg, i touched on a few things in the intro here but can you tell us a little bit more about what you uh what you do out in the world um, like spec is the spectacular spider-man podcast is that wrapped already is there other podcast projects that you're working on or are you still working on that podcast right now i'm i'm still working this podcast we're almost done with the second and Sadly, final season of the show, although I suppose I can't say too sadly. If that show had gotten room for a third season, we wouldn't have gotten Young Justice. I mean, sometimes things work out. That's true. That's true. Yeah. And Spectacular Spider-Man is a great, great show. Great it show. Is. It is. It yeah. definitely, it definitely, definitely, definitely is. I still love it. It's the best Spidey animated series to date, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree. And you and I were talking, uh, we've talked off and on for a a while now. It's taken us a while to get us uh, both on the same schedule here with our strange, uh, with our odd work schedules. Um, But you've known Greg for a long time, right? So, but, and did, but you've also been work, you used to have this degree in production and uh, in screenwriting. So what do you, what do you do right now? Do you, do you work in that industry now? Or are you able, working parallel to it? Are you doing other things with it? Or are you just, you, are you using that education to, to do this analysis and editing and things that you're doing right now? Right now, um, it's mostly going towards analysis, editing, and um, I haven't really been able to break into the industry yet the way I've quite wanted to. It's a very difficult industry. Oh yeah, for sure, man. I, even when you know people, it's so very difficult, but um, I have a lot of friends up in that area in LA. They've been working for years and years. Um, Actually, it was funny. I was talking to Talison Jaffe. I don't know if you know Talison Jaffe. If you're a gamer, you'd know him from Critical Role, uh, Matt Mercer's show. I'll admit I've never been a gamer, but listening to your show made me wish that I had been a gamer. <laughs> Talison and I had uh, had mutual friends from years and years ago, so we've known each other for a couple decades and uh, ran into him at Comic-Con last year, I think. And he was just like, man, it's got to be like been trying to break into this industry for so long and it's got to be a D&D game. <laughs> He's like, it's so weird. It's just, you never know what might work and, and how much stuff that you do and, and work hard to do and, and still don't necessarily get in. Yeah. I mean, I've written a, a couple of screenplays, haven't been able to sell them yet. I remember my film school professor said, this is great. This is original. You'll never sell it. Oh man. Oh, that's tough. That's tough, man. Yeah. yeah I'm sorry. It happens. It happens. I'm, I, so I put it away for a while. Recently, I pulled it back out, and I'm thinking about adapting it into a novel, self-publishing, and seeing where we go from there. You know, and that's a thing, right? So, like, like when I was writing my novel and working on that it, years ago now, this this was right at the beginning of, like, the the boom in, you know, the ability to self-publish. And it's the same thing with podcasting, right? Like, it, it's a thing that you can do in your home and you can do it and you can get it published. You can get it out there and you can get it in front of some people who, who will like it. And you don't need to have necessarily 50,000 people ready to pick up a copy. Like you can, you can aim it at, at a target group that will really appreciate it. Like with this, 
this is this was therapy for us that we you know we joke like I, I want to do this podcast, but mostly so I don't have to bury my friends and all of my young justice geekiness uh, and force it on them. I can record it, and then whoever wants to come by to listen can listen, right? Yeah, yeah. This is what happened. My friends were happy when I got onto the internet back in the late nineties <laughs> and was and found other people to talk to this talk to about this great show called Gargoyles, which gets back into how I first met Greg. So, oh yeah, um, let's hear about this because you've been you've been well involved with this from the early days, yeah. Indeed, yeah, I have. So, um, when back in 1994, I was only 13. I, you know, I watched a lot of TV shows at the time. We had shows like Batman the Animated Series, awesome yeah. show. Mm-hmm. The X Men Animated Series. I remember I was a huge fan of Spidey. I was waiting for the Spider Man Animated Series premiere. But there was also another block called the Disney Afternoon, and there were these commercials for this show called Gargoyles. It was in premiere in October of that year, and mm-hmm. I thought it looked really cool and i checked it out and it quickly became an all-time favorite of mine an all-time favorite yeah absolutely I, even out of those four other shows which i did not see coming because you know it was original property i i went into that with no expectations i mean mm-hmm. you can see on the video cam i've got this huge poster of demona, demona right, right, show, right over right? your head <laughs> yeah yeah it is and it is currently autographed by greg wiseman frank parr who is Greg's partner on the show. Right. And uh, Greg Guler, the character designer who designed her, and Marina Sirtis, her voice actress. That's fantastic. Yeah, there's a lot of questions I wanna I wanna talk to you about the fact that you've been following Greg's career specifically. Because though I also became a fan, that first five part five part intro arc, I was like, five part? What? Like that was huge for the day. And I just became so gripped by the kind of the layers and the complexity that was already being layered into this uh, show from the very beginning. I was yeah. just out of college when it came out. Same thing with Batman, the animated series. And, but there's, but I didn't, Greg's name isn't anywhere really on it. And so I didn't know that until much, much like decades later did I realize that, that Greg uh, was, you know, also involved, you know, like the, this is one of his babies. So I keep talking about what you were talking about. I got a bunch of questions having to do with the evolution. I'll jog back to the back then. They didn't really credit animated series creators the way they do now. Greg Wiseman did not get the co-creator credit from Disney officially until around 2004 or so when the DVDs came out and they uh. gave him that credit there in the DVDs. Well, and you won't see his credit during the five part pilot because he started as a development executive. And at the time it was against policy for executives to receive credits and he moved over to producing the series full time. So yeah. you'll see his name there after the fact. But, um, I think it was really with Batman, specifically Bruce Tim and the Bruce Tim Alan, although Alan Burnett didn't really seek out too much publicity. Paul Dini did. Right. Where he started talking to people who made cartoon shows. It was kind of seen as a lesser form of art at the time, yep. which it really should not have been. But absolutely. That's a, you, that's, I can get in a whole other episode talking about that ridiculousness in the U S but but let, let, let's stay focused on the gargoyles thing here. So, and how did you, you were 13 when it came out. So you, how did you get involved in all of this other stuff? If yeah, my 13 year old self would probably still be shocked that any of it happened at all. Well, I watched both seasons of the show. We don't talk about the third season. And that's uh, what I understand. Yeah. I was at a friend's house in early 1997 and he had this thing called America online, which I didn't have at the time. Ooh. So we went on, I looked at this internet and I was wondering, is there anything about gargles here? And I went there and then I found this site called Ask Greg, which is still the early days that it just opened up. And um, gotcha. there was a, and then there was this convention that was going to be in New York that summer, which I didn't get to go to. <laughs> yeah. But, I, but, but this, but then there was a second convention the following year, also in New York, I did go to. And by then I'd already made pl- a lot of friends in the fandom already. And, um, and I met Greg there for the first time. It was mostly like a fan creator thing. I don't think I made much of an impression that first first year. And um, but he did become really close friends with a close friend of mine, Jennifer L. Anderson. So um, mm. and she worked as a post production assistant later on Spectacular Spider Man. I know she was involved in Young Justice for the first few months of production briefly, but um, that's. Gotcha. But we're getting, gotcha. We're getting ahead. She was a really good friend of mine, and we started just chatting on AOL Instant Messenger. I went, then I went to the fifth annual convention in Los Angeles where we had a ton of guests. And by that time, I swore that I wouldn't miss another one. And I got some friends together. We hosted one of them in 2003 in New York City. And that was when I first, I mean, Greg had already known who I was there because when I went to the first LA one, I specifically walked up to him and reintroduced myself and he yeah. remembered my name throughout the con. And then when he heard that I was playing on putting it together, he 
decided to help out because he was quite involved in the running of these conventions. He didn't run them, but he was a yeah. consultant. I have a, I have a question though. So you were were you did you grow up in L.A.? No. So were you around? No. So New did York. you grow up? You grew up in New York. Okay. So so this is you in New York. All of this stuff is happening in Los Angeles, right? And you are you're a kid in New York who's excited about this show and participating as much as you can get yourself to be able to participate. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you ended up moving to Los Angeles. I'm going to jump ahead a little bit just because I have this question. Was your involvement in this fan space what inspired you to go to Los Angeles and do the degrees that you have? It was one of the biggest, it was one of the largest influences. I mean, I can, there were other large influences watching the behind sure. the scenes documentaries on the Lord of the Rings DVDs, seeing how Peter oh, Jackson made sure. movies that was an influence. The works of Quentin Tarantino also influenced me as well. But this is probably the largest influence out of all of them, especially since I knew him. Cause it also, it's, it's, it's so, it's so early too. You know what I mean? Like so early and, and formative, like this formative media. Uh, level and then being able to have this opportunity to actually meet the creators for stuff like that. I grew up in this small town in Kentucky, so like for me, everything happened somewhere else, right? <laughs> and I was never able to get there to be in that space until I was much, much older and moved to San Diego and was able to at least go to Comic Con and meet a few people at some certain things. But it was still, I, I can't imagine like being around all this wouldn't have influenced me to to maybe do a different path. Yeah, but I've got a great story to tell also. So I hosted a 2003 mm -hmm. gathering in Los Angeles, and um, then it's my responsibility once the convention is over to drive Greg Wiseman back to the airport. And Oh, yes, I've heard some rumors of this story. <laughs> tell me. <laughs> okay. Um, I was Keep in mind, I was a new driver at the time. I'd been driving for about a year, and I had minimal experience driving in Manhattan. Also, GPS that wasn't really a terrible. thing yet. GPS was not a thing yet. I had these right. terrible printed map directions from MapQuest at the time. And um, also, there was a lot of construction going on at the time. So I'm driving Greg to the airport. I can't make the turns that I need to make because of the construction going on. And at one point, as we're getting closer to where we need to get, this guy just clips off my mirror. He gets out, tosses a 20 oh. at me, and then gets back into his car and leaves. <laughs> So we finally crossed the East <laughs> River, and by this point, I am very, very, very nervous. That first accident was not my fault. Greg will acknowledge this. The second that tiny accident. That first accident was not. <laughs> <laughs> the second tiny accident, however, was completely my fault. By then, we're, I'm, I'm kind of panicking. We finally get across the East River. Because also, I've got Greg Wiseman in my car, so this is a. <laughs> right, of course. No pressure. And what happens is we're going up to the toll booth. And his car was already a piece of crap anyway, and it just taps the bumper in front of me. Thankfully, there's no marks, nothing has happened, but yeah, two accidents run one trip. Now, as I understand it, this has made you infamous in that you had been written into the radio plays I was that first, Greg produces for I was, Convergence. We'll get to that, but I do get Greg to the airport we're late, but it's but he manages to make his plane so happy and into that, and I think that's what really made us friends. <laughs> Living through that war zone, <laughs> yeah, pretty much. That's, that's pretty funny. That's pretty funny. So um, you appeared as yourself, right, in these radio plays? Yeah, that started out as a surprise because I'm watching Spectacular Spider-Man when it airs, and it's episode five. It's a Sandman episode. I did not get any warning that this was coming. Harry Osborne makes friends with the jocks. He's, at, he's having coffee with them. And I and the scene opens with his line. And then he gets into a second accident at the toll booth. Worst show forever. I thought my dad was about to pop a blood vessel. <laughs> <laughs> That's really funny. So, so I can assume. Now, normally what I do is I ask people, when did you first watch Young Justice? But clearly having been following Greg's career for decades i'm assuming you watched it as soon as it aired Is yes i did i did yeah, i i had known it was coming but um but yeah as for the radio plays those are both surprises also i was in two of them as myself one the worst chauffeur hired again and then the second one the first one that did involve young justice this is in 2014 i was work because i lost my job as a chauffeur i was a guard over at ravencroft sanitarium and i 
was enthralled <laughs> by Queen B to do- to lock Doctor Ashley Kafka in a closet so that she could free Doctor Octopus. You know, it's a big crossover between these three shows. Oh yeah, of course, yeah, and, absolutely. And Greg did that because he knew I was a huge fan of Demona and a big fan of Marina Sirtis. So to have Marina Sirtis and oh, that was me. nice. And then to shove my friend Jennifer L. Anderson, who was voicing Kafka in this in the in this radio play in the closet, was who I'm mostly really close friends with was um yeah that was greg having a sense of humor that's really funny uh but you can't you can't say these nice things about greg on the show he's got a reputation he has to keep i have to tell you um so um so let's get back to you a little bit here and in your experience here and then then i want to talk to talk to you about some observations that i that i had and then i want to get your opinion on as well so um so you saw Young Justice. You clearly you saw Young Justice on the first on the first run, and mm-hmm. then. But what, what was your history with comics? Like you had this history with gargoyles, but did you have a history with DC Comics in general, or was this like coming into Young Justice where you fairly fresh with the with the material, the the original material he was drawing on? Um, I was. I'm one of those people that prior to this, I'd almost always underestimated DC Comics. I mean, I know you've heard you're that not about, alone. Yeah. I, and to this day, I'm still not entirely sure why, what the, where the impression that I had came from. I, mean, I love Batman, the M8 series. I mean, and Superman, Batman Beyond, Justice League were very well produced shows. I enjoyed them. They didn't quite make the personal connection with me that, say, Gargoyles did, but I, but they were really good television. So I'm not entirely sure where this came from. I was a big Marvel reader. I loved Spider Man. I loved the Avengers. I loved the X Men until it got way too convoluted for me to keep track of. Um, but sure, yeah. But um, and but Gargoyles became this sort of really happy geek property for me. I remember I was really excited when I heard Greg got the Spider-Man gig. Yeah, for sure. Because I knew what he could do, and I knew it was going to be something special, and it was. I mean, I remember that show was announced to um, people who were complaining about the art style with those first images, and I kept telling people, guys, wait, watch it, watch it. They did, and for the most part, it was the most well-received Spider-Man animated series of all time. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's, it, it's one of those things where I look at like people have asked us, um, you know, like other shows that we might do a whelmed style deep dive on and, and there's very few. And of course I'm looking at other properties. Gargoyles comes up a lot. Um, and the Spider-Man one as well. And it's interesting because the Spider-Man property, it's, it's so different than Young Justice in that it's not as ensemble a cast. I don't think any animated series is as ensemble of cast in my experience <laughs> as Young Justice is. But there's this, there seems to be this, gosh, there's a creative fingerprint that Greg leaves on what on the properties that he works at. And we've talked about a little bit on the show as this idea of conscious creation mm-hmm. where he's where he's purposefully thinking way ahead and setting things up to to knock them down as Crispin Freeman says. You know, and but there's there's something more to it. Like there are moments in Gargoyles that I see reflected in uh in Young Justice. This tendency that he was doing decades before Young Justice even came out. And one of those things was like Aliza Maza. Aliza Maza as a character, Aliza, in and of herself, but Aliza Maza's family, having a, a, a mixed race uh, family that's just, it's just accepted as is. This is what this is, and it doesn't matter. Like, it, it just, and even in, in, the, in the 90s, you know, I was looking at this, and it just was something that you could just absorb. I feel like it almost instilled in me this idea of storytelling now that I have about represent representation that I get really upset with shows about where they spend so much time focusing on the representation, almost to the point of ironically making the representation less relevant because they're, they're saying things like, you know, oh, this is a, this is a woman who's a superhero. Oh my goodness. That's incredible. I can't believe there's a woman who's a superhero. And I'm just like, why really? <laughs> because there should be no reason why a woman stop calling your female superheroes. Just call them superheroes and let them let them be presented. And I feel like Greg did a lot of that already, starting in uh, Gargoyles and then bringing that forward into Young Justice. And do you see that th- that kind of fingerprint? Do you see a consistency of things that maybe I haven't seen through the years of these shows that he's worked on? I definitely do. I think for starters, he put he writes them as people. He puts so much these characters. He puts so much thought into who these people are as people. You know their thoughts, their their own internal psychology. I mean, I once heard him go on a 30-minute 
tirade about the psychology of Betty Brand, and she only has maybe a handful of lines of dialogue in <laughs> right, Spectacular exactly. Spider-Man. He just yeah. puts that much thought into everybody. Everybody has her arc. Everyone has her story. I think what – I mean, obviously, some characters will always be more relevant than others towards the narrative, but yeah. from what I from what I can tell – Nobody is insignificant there. Everyone has their own thing going on. He treats these characters as real people. Oh, my goodness. I think you just nailed something that I didn't. Yeah. Every character has purpose. We joke about the the whole thing in Young Justice, this idea of um, no wasted characters. Like if you're going to have we were we just this morning we're talking about um, we're talking about the newest episodes that aired last Tuesday. So this 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 discussion will air a bit down the line. So we're only talking about update uh, episode sixteen of the of third season. But just the idea that a woman gets her purse stolen, and Beast Boy stops the guy turns by turning into an ape, and the person he saved that purse snatching from was Angel O'Day, who is from Angel and the Ape comic from DC comics, right. Who would theoretically grow up to become a detective and have a partner who's a sentient ape from gorilla city. Like it's this thing where it's like, wait, this woman, just a woman who got her purse snatched, but like no character has insignificance, right? Every character is treated with some, some level of significance, no matter how few lines or even no lines they're shown. Like we knew that Arrowette was going to show up, at some point, because we saw her as like a 10 year old in season one in a window. You know what I mean? Like, is that really what it is? This thing about having each character not like have each character gets the honor or like the 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 respect, I guess, is the word I'm looking for to have that deep dive. It's got to be. He's been doing this in Scargles. I mean, the prime example there is uh, this character called Margot Yale, who is a. Uh, who, start, who shows up in the pilot is basically just someone who is terrified of the gargoyles after she is saved from a mugging. And she and she's mostly used, you think, as comic relief. Every time she'll, sh- she'll show up every few episodes, be terrified of them. By the time we get to the comics, Greg's third season comics, she's the assistant district attorney of the city, and she's um, right pretty much becomes sort of their J. Jonah Jameson. Right, right, absolutely. And there are so few shows where I feel like that is the case. And, and I, some of it too, there's a consistency that happens too. Like there are shows where a character early on in a season or maybe in a, in early episodes, uh, actually this happens either way. So you have a character who's just like, I don't know, this feels like a throwaway character. And then later on, they, somebody, a writer down the line or somebody decides, Oh, I'm going to use that character and develop them out or vice versa. You have a character who like an early writer, puts a lot of heart into and thought into, but then a later writer just kind of throws away and doesn't pay attention to, which drives me crazy. But there is this thing about the show running aspect of Greg. So is it, is it the writing? Is it his, his, his uh, concepts as a showrunner? Is it that he puts, I hate to say more effort or more time, but he's more present with the material than some other showrunners do. I tend to think so. He'll, he'll often say, do you, people ask me, do you have plans for this character? Do you have plans for that character? His response is, I have plans for everybody. And most of the time, you know, I think that people are, he, that's just, thro- he's just brushing people aside, but it's actually quite true. I mean, does he have every little detail planned out? I probably not, but he definitely discovers things along the way. I mean, Xanatos' assistant and Gargoyles, Owen Burnett, he knew mm-hmm. he had a, he, they knew he had a secret. They just didn't know, quite know what that secret was until they started developing the se- the second season. And, during the first 10 episodes of season two, they knew what it was and they wouldn't reveal that until near the right. end of the season. And that was a long right. season. <laughs> yeah. So it, it seems to be like there's something in his, in how he creates things that seems to be evident. Now we're talking like, I can ask Greg these questions specifically, but there's a difference between, I think, asking a creator about what their thought process is going in and like, cause your intention can be one thing, but what's being read and what's being seen uh, and understood from the fans' perspective, like what do, what draws you back to the material, right? Is is a question I think is key because when a creator is intending to do something, that doesn't mean it actually it actually happens, right? And there's something there's something that you have of the art and the craft and the tendency and the 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 the, the focus of, of the person's personality that comes across, and there because of seeing this consistency between like say gargoyles, Spider Man, Rebels. Right. First season of Rebels was setting a ton of stuff up. Right. Um, 
you know, and, and particularly Young Justice, of course, um, that allows us to do a show like this, that like Whelm, that we, I can't, I honestly can't do on a lot of other shows. I can't do something this, this level, you know? Yeah. Well, the, I suppose the answer to that is different. I mean, I love the mythology he sets. I mean, it, his worlds feel populated. All of his shows, I mean, yeah, Young Justice might have the densest with cast, but they all have casts of thousands. Gargoyles has a cast of thousands. Yes. Sp- Spectacular experiment. Yeah. It's focused on, one character, but he has a huge supporting cast and a huge rogues gallery. And yes. also for me in particular, I mean, I've always been fascinated by villains, well-written villains. It's so easy to not write the villains very well or just be lazy with the villains or turn them into Saturday morning cackling caricatures. And But I remember back in the 90s, Zanato- David Xanatos and Demona, Demona especially, were revelations to me of what you could – of what you could do with a yeah. with a villain, you know, treating them with as much death and giving them as much personality and even a Xanatos life. Is- was Xanatos was uncomfortable in good ways. Like he's like, okay, because at first you're just like, all right, yeah, he's manipulating them, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's wait, a lo- wait, 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 is he? And Demona was like, oh, her name is Demona. Like you didn't see this coming. And then finding out the complexity of her background and Macbeth and the whole thing with that and the deal she had to make and ability to survive. And I'm just like, ah. To be fair about the name, they traditionally didn't have names, so she didn't get her name until after they were frozen in stone. But yeah. Yes, exactly. But that's what I'm, but that's what I'm saying. Like, even with the, like, there's a, like, she gets, she gets reintroduced to Goliath, right? And the rest of them. It's a beautiful bit of writing because if you're going to create a character and you, you're saying like, oh, this character existed in Scotland way back in the day, right? Um, why was his name Broadway? Why was <laughs> his name, right? You know, and people will just do it anyway. And like, oh, well, that's convenient, I guess. Um, I mean, I've even seen modern shows who do this, shows that I absolutely adore. Um, they'll have characters from space or aliens or something and they come down and they just happen to have, they just happen to have names that translate into English to be exactly the thing that they represent to an American audience. (laughs) That's strange. But here where it's like, we didn't have names. We just knew each other. Mm -hmm. Right. Until we come to the future and realize, okay, this is a thing that maybe we need to do now. And to hear that, to have that name that was given to her. And because again, as a watcher, you're looking at it and they're going, oh, her name's Demona. They named the villain Demona. Okay, great. I, I understand what that is. But then you find out the complexity about how maybe that's not really who she is or what it is and why she's doing what she's doing is complicated. And yeah, it, incredible, incredible villains. Or even Chrisman Freeman just talking about Shocker. Uh, uh, I mean, Electro. Electro, sorry. yeah. <laughs> yeah, where Hello. he was like, it's giving him shock treatments. Like it's it's literally making his brain not work appropriately and he just gets more of a hurricane the more the series goes on. And I'm just like, ugh. Thank you. Yes. I mean, even if you don't see it, even if you don't hear that specifically from a character like a doctor or somebody saying this is what's happening to him, even if you don't see that, it's written into the intention, the underlying presentation of a character. And you still right? get a sense of it. Right. Exactly. You feel it. You you carry an emotional memory away of a character as opposed to uh, when people will do that and then they point it out really obviously, it's nice to have it pointed out sometimes, but there's always this thing and you, you'll get this, this balance you have between, you don't want to spoon feed the reader and make them feel like they're not smart enough to pick up what you're putting down, but you also don't want to be too vague about stuff. And sometimes as the person who's creating the material, it's really difficult to walk that line because, okay, I know where I'm going with Demona. I know what Demona is. How much do I drop? How much do I not drop? How much do I imply? Is this too heavy handed? Is this too light a touch? It's a real hard line to walk when you're trying to develop, particularly something like a villain, uh, like someone like Vandal, right? Vandal you know? Savage is terrific. I was just having this conversation. I mean, part of this was joking, but I was talking about how he's the ultimate example of everything awesome about Greg's villain. He's got the villains. He's got this Machiavellian genius like Xanatos. He's immortal like Demona. You weave him in and out of history. I mean, you tied her in with Macbeth. He was Marduk. He was Genghis Khan. Or Duval from the Gargoyles comics, who's the leader of the Illuminati. I don't 
and you have him leading the light in this entire conspiracy of supervillains. I mean, right. I think everything about Vandal is executed perfectly from his voice casting, both the late great Miguel Ferrer and yep. now David Kay, who I've loved ever since he played Megatron in Beast Wars. And, yeah, yeah. Um, and um, to the character design, I mean, and this is not meant to be a knock on previous designers, but most of the time in the comics, he looks like just a white guy. I like how his design here, he looks... You couldn't really place him to any one race. I could believe this guy was Genghis Khan. I mean, it allows him to both stand out more and yet blend in better. Oh, yeah, that's a great way to put it. Absolutely, absolutely perfect. Like, because he was such a, a literal predecessor, right, to humanity in some way, there's something both familiar and almost... I, I could picture him if we had see, if we see a real life version of of him if he was in real life we would get this impression of that almost kind of that uncanny valley like there's something so familiar about everything about you and also not quite familiar enough to be off putting in some way or to put me on guard in some way and I think they handled it pretty well in Justice League Unlimited as well um, but you. you because in Justice League Unlimited, he wasn't tied into big, long 50,000 year, you know, arcs. Mm -hmm. They pretty much had to focus him on whatever the current Machiavellian plot <laughs> was of the week, um, which is what I expected. Because who thinks about it? First of all, it's extremely difficult to try and put your brain in the mindset of somebody who's been alive for 50,000 years. There's actually a, a, a what I found to be a brilliant movie. I think it's based on a stage play, too, called The Man from Earth. If you haven't seen it, you should go find it. I think and it's I will. A, and it's about this guy who is a teacher. I think he's a teacher at a at a at a at a college, and he's leaving the college. And so he's in his cabin, and he's packing up, and he's leaving. And these other people come to see him um, that that he that wanted to say goodbye, right? But he didn't invite them. <laughs> like they're all invited themselves over to his house for like a surprise going away thing. And he's like, I'm not comfortable with this. And as the night goes on, you start to uncover that this guy has been around for a very long time. And I do not want to spoil what's going on in that because it becomes a deep, um, almost a, a psychosocial, uh, psychospiritual conversation about the meaning of immortality and um, who these people in history may have been and how we may have misinterpreted things about certain people in history. If you like, if you enjoy the Vandal Savage storyline, go, go watch The Man from Earth. I think you can find it on Netflix and whatnot. But not many writers will sit down and think, what is it really like to sit in the mind of someone who's been alive for thousands of years? And what are they doing and why are they doing it? I, and I this wish, is the I wish best interpretation of Vandal I've ever seen. Agreed. I wish mainstream DC Comics would take inspiration from this. I mean, the other versions of Vandal have been pretty good too, but I think Young Justice mm -hmm. did for Vandal what Batman the Animated Series did for, say, Mr. Freeze. Yeah, exactly. And this reinvention of characters, like, I, I make a direct parallel between the Mr. Freeze of Batman the Animated Series and Sportsmaster, right, in Young Justice. Because it's like this character who is not taken seriously at all is kind of a joke, um, you know, it's just too punny for his own good. And then, you know, you you bring him into this modern rethinking and say like, well, no, let's, let's really look at this. Let's get some motivation behind this person. Let's think about what that person is doing and what they're doing and why. And, you know, that kind of thing. And, and sports masters like that, not as, not on a, as deep a psychological level as uh, Victor Freeze is in Batman the animated series, but even just his motivations, right? He's a bad dad. He's a terrible dad, but I understand his motivations uh, uh, in some way that I would not have in the past. Um, and the reinvention of those characters while keeping the heart is very key. But with Gargoyles, it, totally original property, can do whatever you want, basically. You're creating the world as, you know, your whole cloth. As opposed to, again, Rebels, Spider-Man, Young Justice. So this ability to be able to not just create this original property and look at those things, but also to apply those things to a property that already exists, who may not have even exhibit some of those traits or tendencies. Oh, no, definitely. I find that most comic shows based on comic books tend to just, well, the comics did this, so let's put this in here, too, without really going into what worked about that to begin with or really making it their own. Right. I mean, most of the time it feels like they're, it's a checklist. Yeah. Or it's a, what was the most popular thing in the comics? You know, wh who, what did people really like? Oh, they really liked this scene. 
okay, well, let's cut this scene out and we'll put it in our movie, show, animated series, whatever it happens to be. And But it's taken completely out of context. Like, the, the reason why it was amazing wasn't because, you know, somebody exhibited a new power or somebody had a had a different kind of suit or like there wasn't, it wasn't the, the surf what it looks like on the surface to people who don't know the material is not really probably what it's about. Right. It's about, you know, probably the peak. So let's take something like dark Phoenix, right? So a character like dark Phoenix, it's hard to do the dark Phoenix storyline without doing the Phoenix storyline. And it's hard to do the Phoenix storyline. If you didn't understand the relationship between Scott and Jean at the beginning and about how things moved forward and all of the, you know, you know, years and years of storylines. I was reading those comics as they were coming out. And when you get to that point, the reason why there's an emotional punch about who Dark Phoenix is and what Dark Phoenix does isn't because she's got the power to destroy a a solar system. That's not the cool bit. No. It's the emotional bit of the horror in the people that she knows understanding who she has become and what has happened. And you can't do that just whole cloth pulling something out. Not to pick on Dark Phoenix. It's a tough storyline to do, and I think they've been trying to do their best with it. Um, but to, to move to DC, same thing with you know certain DC, like the Superman versus Batman thing, where you've got Batman in a powered suit. Yeah, he looks really cool. But it's not really the su- that Batman's in a powered suit facing off with Superman that's interesting. It's the the 60-plus years of friendship that's being put under pressure that makes that in in the comics so important that maybe didn't get translated enough for me into the movies, right? That's so, a, I mean, you have to build up to that. I think Civil War did a really great job because by then we knew Tony mm-hmm. and Cap, we knew their friendship. Yes, I agree with you, and I think Marvel, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, has done a really, really great job generally. I mean, they've had definitely had hit and miss movies. Mm-hmm. They're movies that I I love that other people don't, and vice versa. But it, you know, this thing is the thing is epic, and I think you're right with Civil War. For me, I was looking at it like you can't understand what's happening in their version of Civil War if you don't understand the relationship between Cap and Bucky, it's- if you don't understand the relationship between Cap and and Tony, right? <laughs> like that is. That is correct. I mean, I, I often say this to people when I'm debating between different versions of movies, characters, shows, is that really at the end of the day, the people are the cake, the powers are the icing. Yeah, absolutely. And they and in the when we did interview um, Greg and Brandon and Phil, they were talking about like how the show developed and that it was originally it's it's really just it's a secret agent show. That also that's teenagers and teenage drama, and also they happen to have superpowers. Like superpowers, like it's even third. It's the decoration on the icing on the cake, <laughs> right? Like <laughs> that's what it is. Right? But you're looking at that, and I think that that's important. It's the same thing in screenwriting when you're looking at particularly science fiction shows. It, I mean, the special effects are like a, a show like The Expanse. I was completely blown away by the expanse. The special effects are breathtaking. The science behind it, the hard science kind of foundation for it, absolutely incredible. Not the point of the show, right? (laughs) The point of the show is this driving interpersonal and interplanetary and political and social drama that's going on, driven by these characters that you're compelled by. And also the gravity stuff and everything that they do in there for traveling through just our own solar system, not even intergalactically or anything like that is just, it's amazing. And if you can, if you can keep that stuff and keep that in the background or not the background, you can highlight it. Just don't make it the point. Right. And I think that that's key. And I think with gargoyles, like I was fascinated by this idea of these gargoyle characters, but like the way that they were presented in the modern day, Right. And they're, I I don't know, there was something about how they were brought forward. It wasn't about their powers, right? It wasn't about their abilities. It was about who they were and what they were trying to accomplish in the world. It was, it was the stranger in a strange land story, really. Yeah. In in some ways you can almost say like Superman is the immigrant experience. I mean, they, they're in this new world. They don't know it and they have to adapt. And the smart thing of that show did was it didn't do the fish out of water jokes too often. It did them a lot early on when it made sense, but they acclimated. They yeah. slowly got used to things. It did become home. I mean, they adapted. Mm-hmm. I mean, most, I yep. feel like most shows would just be playing the same fish out of water joke all the way up until episode, say, 65. Right. Absolutely. Because you, cause there's this thing too, like this idea, this fear of we've created a character that say for the first 15 episodes, people love. Okay. Well, let's not change them. Right. We got to keep them the same. We got to get everything back to one right at the beginning of every episode. Even if we're trying to do a, an arc 
uh, across a, a series or, or, or a season, we need to have the character not change that much because they don't want to like quote unquote ruin the character. And in young justice, I look at Superboy. Right. Superboy is so different in season three than he is in the first episodes of season one. And you see actual character growth. But I can understand the idea of like, oh, we have angsty strong guy. We people like angsty strong bad boy. Let's not change angsty strong bad boy. Right. I can get that from a production standpoint or toy selling standpoint or something. But there's something off about that mentality that I think um, doesn't and it doesn't get translated into like the first couple seasons of Gargoyles or Spider-Man or things. People characters are allowed to change as it should be because people in real life change. At least I hope we do. <laughs> I, I would hope so. Change and evolve and learn. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, I, I remember I wrote my I, I write reviews for World's Finest for Young Justice. and I wrote about in my review for evolution that ironically vandal has not really evolved all that much he's he is still i mean in his mind he's a hero a visionary but when you look at the heroes of ancient times like marduk they were nationalists they were conquerors they were brutal to their enemies he hasn't changed no he hasn't changed and i find that i do find that to be a fascinating aspect of him but it wouldn't he has almost he's got this momentum of a lifetime of not living in the last in the last 100 years like the rest of us have. Like we're all human memory has a problem, right? Mm-hmm. So like what was hor- like we look at even something like our educational system, right? 150 years ago our educational system was entirely different. And the educational system that we have right now has evolved from a different kind of educational system. And is that appropriate for the modern day? Because technology and everything else has moved forwards. Um, even even psychosocial and psychoemotional and psychospiritual awareness of the human condition has evolved differently. So does this education system work? But for us, it's like, oh, well, that's what we've always done, quote unquote. And it's like, well, always only reaches back like 100 years. Mm-hmm. Well, right? Te- yeah, well, technology-wise, he's adapted, obviously, but he's still, right. in, he's still in the same – course that he was a dark side way back when he made that initial pact with him when he was Genghis Khan. Right. And when you're talking about Genghis Khan, this, the Genghis Khan, <laughs> the largest, the largest empire in history. And so I, I have a, I can kind of get it if he's looking at that going like, no, that worked fine. <laughs> that, <laughs> that, that clock doesn't, that clock's not broken. <laughs> I don't need to fix that clock. Oh. I need to, I need to expand it and make it something different. Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, bit of trivia. Genghis Khan had his oldest son poisoned for the good of the empire at one point, and he loved him, but he wanted to spare him pain and do what was right for the empire. Sound familiar with the end of evolution? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And so, what what the problem with villains in a lot of cases is is that stagnant nature, that inability mm-hmm. to. That, that I evil for evil's sake. And I think that it works great as an exception, right? So you got the, the Heath Ledger Joker where they kind of focus on that and they make that the point. They're making a point. Like the exception proves the rule. Some men just want to see the world burn. I'm okay with that. Normally I'm not okay with that. I was okay with that. Mm-hmm. And with Vandal, this consistency of his plan throughout his whole lifetime of 50,000 years, um, is being fed you know, not just because we, we don't want to spend the time thinking of a deeper plan for him. It, it, it's layered on things. And there are examples he has of his past of things that have worked and things that haven't worked and why didn't they work and improving this plan as he moves through the future. But, you know, you look at, I look at Captain Boomerang and I'm like, he's a mercenary. He wants money. I'm okay with that periodically as well. But then you look at someone like Cheshire and you're like, this is a complicated situation of a human being that has more things going on in her life and abuse and who she is and how she feels about herself and the trauma and like all of this stuff going on. So you can have all of those things in one space. If you have, if it's, if it's all one note, then it becomes like, yeah, it's just the villain of the week. Right. Cheshire was one of the biggest surprises of the show. I mean, I love how they handled Cheshire. Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, the Spider-Man show I'm not as familiar with. I've watched both seasons. I enjoyed both seasons, but I have not watched it over and over again. Are there parallels to that storytelling in the the spectacular Spider-Man that you're seeing in Young Justice World? I mean, they were only a few years apart, really. Yeah, de- definitely within especially the whole arc of the education of Peter Parker. I mean, Peter, I mean, he goes, he has his troubled love life as well. I mean, the Teenage angst, which we see a lot of in 
with um, the relationships that are developing among the heroes throughout the course of the show. I mean, yeah, it's easy to compare Peter with Wally West. I tend to think there are times he's a little bit more consciously thoughtful than Wally, but he, and yeah. then, and then times not. I mean, he's. I mean, he could have. He did not handle the relationship with Liz as well as he should have, and. To be honest, he didn't really know how to handle it. That was his first real romantic relationship. I mean, I oh, no, yeah. I mean, I'm not sure if Wally was ever dating anyone before the series started. I get the feeling not, but <laughs> <laughs> I get the feeling not too. And man, I don't even want to think back on my high school and college days. I was a train wreck. So <laughs> yeah, I can you know, <laughs> I'm sorry to everyone who lived around me. Um, so yeah, I, I totally get that with that idea. And then we talked about the villains a little bit, but what about the supporting cast character? Cause characters, cause that's a big thing in young justice too. I mean, even characters, you know, like, like, uh, like Marvin and Wendy show up in young justice. That's so funny to me that these little dots and flavors of supporting cast characters show up, but Spider-Man, like you were saying, like the focus is on Peter, obviously, but his supporting cast not just not the villains, but just the supporting cast is so rich in that show as well. Like, and they and they don't have the superpowers. The one of the storylines I remember, I mean, even I think it was, I may have been the last episode where they were doing the Shakespeare play. Second to last episode, but yeah, second to last episode. That was like that was like Greg Weissman all over that episode. Can you talk about that episode a little bit and kind of like all of the characters and how they're rep- represented in that? Oh, the man loves his Shakespeare. That's for sure. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. I mean, he, he got me. He got me into it. But um, it's just, well. I mean, you see, F- Flash Thompson in the first episode. He's this typical bully, and now he's re- he's performing Shakespeare with um the woman he's the girl he started dating. We had to shake down a little bit. It was Shashan. I mean, he's playing uh he's playing Nick Bottom, and uh, she's playing mm-hmm. Queen Titania, and they're having a love affair throughout that, and he's enjoying. It immensely whereas when he when he was uh auditioning which he only did to try to date her he um he, he was reading the dialogue is this supposed to be english and i right. know people who've had reactions like that to shakespeare i see it all the time still to this day but flash thompson has one of the best develop arcs throughout out of any of the supporting cast on that show i mean we we see, we are introduced to a two-dimensional bully and we end up with a three-dimensional human being which happens yeah. all the time in young justice happens all the time in gargoyles i mean greg likes to always like like it's like an onion you're peeling back the onion and see all the layers with everybody right. i mean right and obviously greg put the shakespeare play in there mostly to indulge himself he admits that but it worked it was it was amazing i mean you know you have the green goblin reciting puck's lines of dialogue at various times and he's not even in the play and <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. It was it was a beautiful thing. And it's a thing that like uh Emily and I were talking about it and also my wife and I were talking about it. I think I got in a conversation online recently on Twitter about it as well. This idea of the frustration I have of like introducing high school kids to Shakespeare by having them sit around and read a Shakespeare play. Um that's adults. not how to do it, right? You, 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 when you watch this episode of, of something like Spectacular Spider-Man and you get these characters and you know who these characters are and you hear the emotion in their voice and you hear the intonations and you hear what's meant to be said, you don't need to listen to the, to the words. You need to listen to the story. And there's, that's two completely different things. I do not need to understand the words to necessarily understand the story. And in that, I see that and I'm like, God, there's got to be some, some, you know, kids out there, you know, even adults who are watching this show and thinking like, oh, this is, whoa, that's not what I remember from, from high school sitting around with people reading their Shakespeare with monotone and not knowing what it's supposed to be. Right. And uh, I think it's, I think it's absolutely brilliant. It needs to be brought in more. You need to make the material fun for people because really it is. It is. It's so much fun because, again, there's so much going on, like you're saying in that episode, that's not just – we're not just watching a play, right? You're watching the development of the story that we've already been a part of. Mm -hmm. And the dialogue just mixing and matching with what Spider-Man is doing at the time, trying to escape from this prison. The Green Goblin has trapped him in and just want to say for the record that the Green Goblin arc on that show was fantastic. They took a mystery that – he took a mystery that everybody knows the result of and still made the second guess it. 
Yeah, absolutely. And he does that with Young Justice as well, which is a brilliant thing. Being able to think, and that's why you know we've been like, is this, what is going on with Tara? <laughs> like, what's happening here? Is this really her? Is it not? Are they going to go with the momentum of the history of the character? Because they never really yeah. have in the past. Somehow they honor it while turning it on its head. You know, so, you know, we're going to have to see what comes up yeah. from there as well. I admit, so, I've, I've never read the original Judas Contract. I mean, I stupid me, I need to go back and do that. But I mean, no, just- not, not at all. The, the original Judas Contract has, has a real strong emotional memory for me, but I went back to reread it and it's it's troublesome and, and difficult to get through because it was definitely mid to early 80s. Um, like Tara is like, no, she's not the villain of this. Tara is abused by everyone, including the Titans. Uh, it's difficult to watch what happens in that <laughs> in that story arc. Um, and these characters that I had thought were here felt were heroes to me when I was younger. I'm just like, you guys are not acting in a way that moder- that I would look back on and th- say like, I don't remember you being like this. So it can it can be a little bit of a challenge to go back and read the original material and to be able to bring it forward and modernize yeah. it. Like characters like Halo, for example. Halo is so complicated and complex, and Young Justice is so deep in my opinion, complex isn't the right word, just deep and interesting in a way that I don't remember the original Halo being, except for the fact that we find out that she was like a, an assassin, like a horrible person before she got her powers. And that was interesting, but also yeah. I want to say it just once Halo is a mother box. <laughs> Halo is a mother box. Yep. <laughs> yep. Everybody, everybody knows now. Yep. Spoilers. You got your spoiler warning. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I just love that running joke. I just wanted to do it once. <laughs> <laughs> you absolutely, you're allowed to participate. So, um, so what is it? So you, you said you're you're wrapping up um, the Spectacular Spider Man podcast. Do you have other things that you're kind of looking at doing, or is there other kinds of ideas or things that you want to do that maybe maybe not even related to Greg's material and work? Um, not quite yet. I mean, there's something that I'm developing right now, but I do not have permission yet from the person I'm developing with to announce it. We're so waiting to work out the logistics. Gotcha. But like, I'm just kind of looking at what the future, like you've, you, you've obviously been influenced by Greg in a bunch of different ways, but are you drawing that? Do you want to draw that into work that you're doing or is it, is it inspiring you to do work that you're doing? Is it something that you want to do something different than like, how, how is it affecting you as a person and a creator of your own material? Oh, it's going to influence me no matter what. It taught me how to write characters, develop characters, make sure that everyone is a person and not a prop. Yes, thank you. Yes, fantastic. I mean, I mean, it taught me to put thoughts into my villains. I mean, Demona is one of my favorite villains of all time. Like I said, you see the poster behind me. I, I have her tattooed on me my <laughs> as well. I mean, my friend Jennifer L. Anderson, who is one of the reasons why I'm friends with Greg, the one who worked on Spectacular Spider-Man. Yeah, right, yeah. Mm-hmm. Justice, she drew this tattoo for me. So that's a, she's a close friend of mine, so that brings it even Deeper More meaning. personal. Yeah, I understand. Totally. So Demona shows up in my writing often, even when I don't mean her to, there'll always be a little bit of her, a little bit of Xanatos, and now definitely a little bit of the light. I mean, because, well, there's a lot of Xanatos in the light from what I've gleaned across these three mm-hmm. seasons. I mean, mm-hmm. the way the way he writes villains, and also establishing your theme, keeping your theme in mind, like for Gargoyle, Stranger in a Strange Land, as well as Don't Judge a Book by Its Cover, for Spidey, mm-hmm. you've got the education of Peter Parker, and for Young Justice, Secrets and Lies, which was definitely a the theme of season one. Mm-hmm. I'm not entirely sure that's entirely gone away. I mean, Halo certainly seems to be living up to that right now, as of yes. episode 16, and and I don't really blame her, because I'm looking forward to seeing what happens next. I mean, how much of what Gabrielle did is going to be Halo's fault, and... Right, exactly. Like, in what or who is Halo? And Halo even questioning, like... I mean, largely she was a mother box, as we mentioned, but even she was saying in this, you know, one of these recent episodes, this idea of like, I don't know what I, like, I didn't have a gender before. Like they call me a mother box, but it's really a rough translation of something of an idea, not a concept, not necessarily a gender. And I know I'm in a female body now, but it could have just as well been a male body. And like, you know, like, I don't know who or what I am and and having those questions and and offering that up and trying to have that discovery of who you are and being okay with it, you know, and, and being able to voice it, you know, so great. Amazing. Uh, I thought it was amazing they did that. And I'm glad 
Zero got to be, got to, Zero Fasal got to voice this uh, groundbreaking character from the animated series. By the way, a little bit of a shout out to her if, if she's listening to this. I'm very proud of how far she's come. The first time I met Zira was at the 2001 Gathering. She was just a fan like any of us there. Yeah. She, uh, <laughs> she mentioned mean, that to us. That's amazing. Yeah, that, that convention was days after we both graduated from high school. Separate high schools. We didn't know each other prior to that. But um, so, yeah. so I see how far she's come along and it's amazing and I'm glad she's doing this. That's fantastic. Well, let's let's wrap this up then. Thanks so much for coming to the Watchtower, Greg, and talking to us about the entire almost arc of history of Greg Weissman's work. Where can people find you here on Earth Prime if they want to chat with you about Spider-Man, about Rebels, about Gargoyles, about anything else that you're up to? Um, I'm on Twitter, at GregXB1. Don't let the... Um I mean, I, mean, I tweet about politics way too often. Don't let that put you off. I will turn that <laughs> off to um, talk about other things. I need to get my mind off of that so I don't be angry. <laughs> That's un- I understand. Yeah, and the, and you can find me at spideydude.com. I'm the host of a uh, spectacular radio, and I also participated on Clone Saga Chronicles, which we're wrapping up as well, which was a in depth look back at the '90s Clone Saga, which was a actually a lot more fun to look back on than one might think. Oh, uh, you're talking about the Tatarzyki one, the cl- Clone Wars? Series, no, no, the Spider-Man Clone Saga from the '90s oh. in the comics. My friend Zach, Sorry. who's the ho- who owns the site, was the host of that, and I participated. So it was fun going back and reading all these. Bad, good, and even sometimes great 90s comics. Nice. Yeah, it's always a mixed bag. Yeah, the Clone (laughs) Saga gets a bad rap, but there are some real gems in there. Fantastic. Thanks to everyone for spending some time with us. If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on Tumblr at the YJFiles.tumblr.com, on our website, CrashingTheMode.com. If that isn't enough, you can email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. If you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. If you do leave us a rating, uh, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you're outside the U.S. We have to look a little hard to find those. If you are able to support us monetarily, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even a dollar a month can help us do in-person interviews, actual play podcasts, fan meetups, discussion sessions, and more. And as always, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours, under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed.